Games are not real, but sometimes they have a lot to reveal. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my Foul Play February series. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is just, oh my gosh. Um, you may know true crime, but if you don't know this case, it is one of the biggest, most chilling, and one that I felt the most relief knowing that this killer is locked up. By the way, I am posting every single day this month for Foul Play February, so if you were interested in this type of content, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Why would you want to miss it? And if you know you want to make me really happy today, you could give this a thumbs up and leave me a nice comment down below. Those are always appreciated, but let's get back to the story. And let me add right here that this is in Russia and all of these names and places are Russian, so if I mispronounce them, please do not yell at me. I am trying my best but they are very hard, you'll see. So this all takes place in Moscow's Bitsiv Park, which is a 5,436 acre piece of land that is just for people to go to relax. But one of them was there to kill, and yet he was getting away with it. In 2001, people began disappearing, but hardly anyone noticed. Four years later, on October 15, 2005, a body was found. It was 31-year-old Nikolai Rebolf, and he was found with blunt force trauma to the head with a bottle smashed into the wound and his brains all over the ground. That was horrific enough, but then a month later, they found 63-year-old Nikolai Zahajenko. Two weeks later, Vladimir Dodunkin. One week later, Nikolai Corrigan. And it didn't stop there. Seven bodies were found by Christmas on December 25th, and every single one had blunt force trauma to the head with either a bottle or a stick inside. And they were not concealed whatsoever. They were mutilated and out in the open for everyone to find. And if the talk of a serial killer didn't scare you enough, the fact that they were calling him the bits of maniac would. The press was going crazy with this, getting all the information they could to warn the public, but scaring them as well. But they should have been terrified because people were disappearing into the woods that were far away enough from the road that nothing was visible, and they were either never found again or were found brutally murdered. And there was no evidence of the killer. They had no trace of who this person was. So it just seemed like a faceless beast that was killing people in the night. That he was hiding in every corner, living in the shadows, and preying on the weak. A forensic scientist looked at all the skulls and he really couldn't see much. He couldn't get much evidence out of it. Besides the fact that the weapon was an angle-edged object, which was possibly a hammer. The only sort of suspect they had a theory on was that the psychiatric ward that was near the park had somehow let one of their patients loose and he was roaming the park, hiding, and then killing people when no one was around. But there was not really much to go on and they couldn't find any missing patients at the psych ward. The park was religiously monitored after all of this was happening. They were questioning anyone who looked slightly suspicious, but the park was huge and to look for every single person in the park, to look at them to see if they were decent enough or if they needed to question them, was a large task. No one was really catching their eye and if they were, they would question them and they wouldn't be anyone who necessarily seemed like they were there to kill and so they would let them go. Then they came across a cross-dresser or someone who dresses in the opposite gender of what they are. So this was a male dressing in what is said to be traditional woman's clothes, although I don't find that fabric has a gender, but nonetheless they were dressing in another gender's clothes and this of course made the police stop them and ask them what they were doing. This person struggled and they found a hammer in their purse, which was thought to be the murder weapon. So they were instantly taken for interrogation. But upon interrogating, by the end of the day, they knew it wasn't them. They had a strong alibi and it just didn't fit. They said that the whole reason they were carrying a weapon the hammer was because of the people who would try to attack them for how they looked. So it was just for their protection. At least 12 bodies had been found by this point and the MO was always the same. 
but that was about to change. It was April 2006 and a 48 year old was about to be found. Her name was Larissa Kalagama and she was a supermarket worker. In June, another woman was found who had the exact same wounds as all of the others and they still didn't know who this killer could be. And then they found a metro ticket in her pocket. And now they finally had somewhere to look because possibly she was with this killer and they caught it on the surveillance footage or maybe the killer was just following. But still, there was a chance that they could get a glimpse at who the person was who had been doing this or who had at least done it to her. And they got even luckier because while they were searching through the whole bulk of footage that they had to go through to find one woman, her son came forward and identified her. She was 36-year-old Mariana Mascuela, and that night she had gone out with her boyfriend for a walk. And he had one of the biggest pieces of evidence in this case. Because his mother had left him a note saying where she was going, that her phone wasn't working, and leaving him her boyfriend's number. Her boyfriend's name was Sasha. They tracked it back and found that it didn't belong to a Sasha at all, but an Alexander Pukushin. But I found that Alexander is commonly shortened to Sasha in Russia. And he was a grocery store clerk and seemed innocent enough. But that's the problem with assumptions. Then video proof of them together was found at that metro station and they had enough evidence to arrest him. They believed they had found their killer. And on June 16th of 2006, they went to his apartment and they arrested him for murder. He was quite calm, insisting that they had the wrong one. For now, they were only charging him with Mariana's murder. He refused to confess, but they were not believing a word he said. And after a few hours, I think he finally realized that because he confessed to her murder. But then, he also wanted it to be known that wasn't the only person he killed. He was a bits of maniac. After his confession unraveled, the police knew that he was more of a monster than they ever could have imagined. And they had already suspected him of 14 murders. You see, Alexander has murdered his first victim when he was 18 years old in 1992. It was a classmate of his that he had brought out, and he had wanted this classmate to kill with him to go on a killing spree, but this classmate wasn't serious about it. He wasn't going to do it. And so Alexander ended up murdering him. And then... Because he was one of his close friends, he was questioned in the disappearance, which must have scared him enough that he didn't kill for another nine years. And when he began again, he stepped it up. He handed a diary of his over to the police, and then he told them how he liked to remember his victims. He told them about a chessboard he had where he liked to number the squares. But he was disappointed because he wanted to fill up all of the squares, which is 64, and he didn't get all of them filled. He only got to 61. 61 deaths, and he said that all but one were done in that park over 14 years. He explained that he targeted elderly homeless men and that he would kind of entice them in with vodka and he would drink with them before killing them. He would repeatedly hit them over the head with a hammer and then shove the broken bottle into the wound that they had been drinking out of. He eventually added younger men, children, and women to his hit list as his targets, but he would always stand behind them when he killed them to avoid the blood spill and to surprise them. He expressed no remorse during this confession, only that he felt like a god deciding who got to live or die. But if that wasn't creepy enough, how he worded the entire phrase just showed how disturbed he really was. He said, In all cases, I killed for only one reason. I killed in order to live. Because when you kill, you want to live. For me, life without murder is like life without food for you. I feel like the father of all these people, since it was me who opened the door for them to another world. He said with Marina, he had met her a few days before and asked her on a date to have a picnic in the park. And once they were there, he was watching her, contemplating on whether she should get to live or die. Now they needed to find these bodies because they needed to confirm this confession for the court. And I mean, for the victim's families as well, they wanted to find out if it was true and give them the bodies for proper burial to their loved ones. The search first started at his apartment where they did find the chessboard with 61 boxes. 
marked. But finding evidence to connect him to 61 bodies seemed like an impossible task. So they decided to take him, Alexander, back to the park where he had done all of this so he could reenact it for them. He took them to each crime scene, he remembered the little details, and he wasn't afraid to reenact it in front of them on camera. They brought this mannequin and they had him basically do whatever he did to the victims on it and it's just chilling how he just went at it. He didn't care. He remembered exactly what he had done with each one, how they reacted, and he had no remorse in the world. But thankfully he was handcuffed to an officer the entire time so he couldn't escape. They also found in his apartment building the hammer that he said was the murder weapon. But do you remember that one that I said wasn't murdered in the park? Well that was a 40 year old man he was homeless, his name was Slavo, and he was lifted onto the balcony rim by Alexander and then pushed over. But everyone just believed it was suicide. He claimed 61 murders, but he eventually began saying different numbers, 48, 49, 61, and eventually he said he just lost count. While they searched through the park to find his crime scenes, he led them to a 36-year-old named Olay who had never even been found. And after they found him, they still had many bodies that weren't ever found. And he told them that was because he put most of them down the sewer that was in the park. And they would have washed up somewhere else or never come out of the sewer. They found some bodies, but some were never found. Investigators, through all of their effort of months of trying to collect evidence to collect victims, they came up with evidence for 49 murders. But Alexander had the audacity to be angry at them for not finding all of them. But a psychiatrist found him sane enough to begin trial, so that's what happened. He did, however, have antisocial personality disorder as well as narcissistic personality disorder, but he knew exactly what he was doing, making him sane enough for trial. The media was covering this like crazy all around the world and he was getting exactly what he wanted. I mean, he had killed more than Ted Bundy and more than a local Russian serial killer named, named the Rostov Ripper who had killed 53 women and children. Some believed Alexander was wanting to be like the Rostov Ripper because the year he committed his first murder was the year the Rostov Ripper was convicted. But now the Bits of Maniac was about to be convicted as well. And on October of 2007, he was put in a glass cage during the trial to confine him from hurting anyone else and charged with 49 murders and three attempted murder. He didn't even have all those bodies. They just happened to have enough evidence for that number of murders. He was convicted of those, but then he asked if they could add the 11 people that they hadn't convicted him for, making it 60 murders, three attempted, because he didn't think the other 11 should be left out. After six weeks of trial and three hours of jury deliberation, he was convicted to a life sentence in prison, as well as the first 15 years being in solitary confinement. When asked if he had any regrets about anything, he said yes, that they caught him too soon, because two days after he was caught, he had planned to murder another woman. But something that completely baffled me was that four years prior to him being caught, a woman in a hospital had asked the nurses to call the police because she had been attacked by him. She named him Alexander Pukushin and she said that she had met him at the metro station, that she was going to buy some cameras from him, and that he said that he had kept them in the woods and she was so desperate for money that she needed to get these cameras. I think she wanted to do some of the, like, you know, camera girl type stuff. And she was very pregnant at the time, meaning she needed money for her future child. And so she went into the woods and he took her to the sewer where he told her to look in and then he tried to attack her. He threw her in the sewer, but she survived and 20 hours later, she climbed out and went to the hospital, severely injured. But she told them his name, and they didn't do anything about it. And he went on to kill many, many more that could have been prevented if they would have just listened to her. But what makes a person do this? Kill, and then kill 60 more times. Well, Alexander was born April 9th, 1974 in Moscow and he lived in a small apartment with his mother and his sister, and he was a very sociable child. 
but it said when he was four years old, he fell backwards off a swing and hit his head. And then the swing came down and hit the front of his head as well. It's speculated that this damaged the frontal cortex, which causes poor impulse control as well as aggression and is often seen in killers to have damage to their frontal cortex. And it made it worse that he was still a child at this time. When he went back to school, children would call him a retard and he was soon transferred out of regular school to a school for children with disabilities. He eventually went to live with his grandfather who was the one who taught him how to play chess and took him to the park to play against old elderly men. But later on, his grandfather died and his anger got even worse. Then he began to follow children around, and by this point he was like a teenager, he began to follow children around with a camera, holding one upside down on camera, saying, you are in my power now. I am going to drop you from the window and you will fall 15 meters to your death. And it's said that at that point he didn't, that the killing hadn't started yet, but in 1992, it would. And after he was caught, his sister said, if he had killed people he didn't know in another neighborhood, it wouldn't have been as bad, but he killed people he knew. Which in either case is bad, but like, I get her point. But all his mother had to say was, I don't think I knew my son very well. In the end, Alexander said, even though he had this chessboard with 64 squares, that he wouldn't have stopped at 64. He would have just kept killing. But then why did he start leaving the bodies for people to find? Because it was working so well to just throw them down the sewer, no one was catching him. It was almost as though he wanted to be caught. It left more evidence. It left a knowledge that something was happening in the area. And it left him to be caught. Did he want to be known finally for what he had done? Was he so close that he didn't think that they would catch him before he finished his chessboard? I just think that this is one sick, individual and the pictures of him just his eyes it's not like looks anybody can like look angry or mean and be the kindest person but if you look at his eyes and eyes can tell so much about a person and you can just tell his are hollow and dark and just gives me chills every time i look at them but yeah there's definitely not a ton of information as far as like i couldn't find every single victim's name but that's because they didn't necessarily know every victim and they didn't know, you know, where the bodies were or they couldn't get all the evidence. So it's just kind of a what he said, which do we believe a serial killer? Probably not the best idea, but do I think he had the audacity to do all of that? Yes. You'll have to leave me down below what you think. Um, of this entire thing if it creeped you out if you know of any killer that's worse than this because unfortunately there are a lot of messed up people in this world and he's probably not the only one that th that is this sick so do you think it was just the hit to his frontal cortex that did it or do you think it was just a combination of everything or what i will leave you with this creepy story and i hope that if you watched it at night you watch a disney movie after this to calm yourself down it's okay i promise you'll be okay don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Bye. Having a God complex will never make you superior.